Welcome to today's study, everyone. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you for your time and your energy. It will be approximately 45 minutes, could be a wee bit longer, but hopefully it's profitable. The study is based on finding God's message in the Bible, and it's part of the continuing series, Exploring the Bible. Details of where you can find previous studies are on the last slide. So today's topic is spiritual split personality and God's rescue. Believers in Jesus Christ are asked to model their life and their behaviour on the Lord Jesus Christ. That ask translates as behave rather differently to usual human self-interest ways. That's a big ask because look what the New Testament says about that. It says there is a tension between godly behaviour and human behaviour. In fact, it's described as warfare. However, our wonderful God provides a rescue package for the battle and its effects. It means that his awesome love is on display yet again. So split personality, the formal name for that is dissociative identity disorder. It's a medical disorder and in official ease, here's a definition. A split personality refers to dissociative identity disorder, DID, a mental disorder where a person has two or more distinct personalities. The thoughts, actions and behaviours of each personality may be completely different. In the process of preparing this, I discovered that is not what schizophrenia is. So big learning curve for me, but apparently 64% of Americans think dissociative identity disorder is really schizophrenia, but it's not. No disrespect is felt or intended towards any person suffering from this sad disorder. And this study is not about DID. Um, and there's the reference for where the definition in dark blue came from, medical news today. This is about inner conflict. The Apostle Paul wrote this about his split personality when discussing what controlled his life. He said, so I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in the members of my body waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. So we're going to talk about that split personality, that war, that battle. Do we need to be absolutely in despair because of this battle, or is there a solution for it? There certainly isn't a drug for it, my friends. 
Okay, so back to some basics. The starting point for this study is God's intention when he created people at the beginning. This is what God said was his intention. He said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. So what does that mean? In our likeness. God likeness can be exhibited in four ways. Mental, physical, moral and spiritual. The four elements of a human. We have thinking capability. We have physical strength. We have spiritualness and hopefully we have morality. People have some kind of morality, whether it's good or bad. So God said people were to be like him in all of these elements. That was God's idea. And when they were first created from the dust of the ground, Genesis 2 verse 7, God's made in my physical and mental likeness intention was satisfied. However, the people created did not achieve moral and spiritual likeness to God. Their failure under trial prevented that. Have a read again of Genesis chapter 3 and last week's seminar in this series, which was about the failure under trial of the first two humans. So God made people physically and mentally like him. So we think like God and apparently we look like God. However, we do not behave like God. Well, not easily anyway. So another of the basics is about Jesus Christ. However, moral and spiritual likeness to God was displayed in Jesus Christ. First, it was prophesied, it was said that he would be like God's character because his foster father, Joseph, was told the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And the word Emmanuel is a description, it's not normally used, it wasn't a name used for the Lord Jesus Christ. He was called Jesus, which means God saves people. But he would be described as God with us. So start thinking likeness of God and the model that we have is the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus said this of himself, while praying to his father, I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. So when he reviewed the work that he had done just before his death, he was satisfied that he had shown God to the people that God had given him. He also said this to Philip one of his disciples. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father. That will be really cool if you do that. And Jesus said, oh, Philip, anyone who's seen me has seen the Father. Have I been with you all this time and you haven't caught on yet? I think Philip was a bit like me, a bit slow to catch on to things. But Jesus said, if you see me, you see the Father's character. And the New Testament teacher, 
Paul wrote this about Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God. So we have God's own words that Jesus would be Emmanuel, God with us. That was a prophecy by God. We have Jesus making his own claim that he had shown God to people. And we have Paul writing that as well. So what about followers of Jesus? One of the instructions that given to followers is be imitators of God, therefore. So copy God, be in God's likeness. Therefore, as dearly loved children and live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. So easy peasy, eh? Jesus followed God, we follow Jesus. In other words, believers, be in the likeness of God in your moral and spiritual life as God desired when he created people. Down to earth with a thud, reality. Real life for followers of God is rather different. And my friend, can you please read Romans 7 verse 14 to the end? That will be Viv. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Viv has no microphone, so I will read that for us. Romans chapter 7, starting at verse 14. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself that do it, but it is sin living in me. I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil that I do not want to do, that I keep on doing. Now, if I, know, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in the sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. Down to earth with a thud. Reality is very different to what God desires and what we might desire as well. Here's an Old Testament commentary about human nature. The heart is deceitful above all things 
and beyond cure. It's clearly not talking about a physical heart. It's talking about our inner being. That generally speaking, we are deceitful and beyond cure left to ourselves. So compare this one. What does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Those two verses define the grounds of battle. The human way or God's way? The human way. When a choice about behaviour is required, a decision needs to be made about which way to go. Sometimes instantly, like that. Sometimes over an extended period of hours, of days, of months, maybe even years. Human nature is good at excuses, blame statements, seeing how much can be got away with, errors of judgment, just plain forgetfulness and on occasions, absolute rebellion. That is the human way. You see why it's a war. Last week, the process of sin was considered. Starts with temptation, which triggers desire. If desire is left, to grow, to work through like yeast in bread, it leads to sin and sin inevitably leads to death is God's declaration in the Bible. And there's more. Everything that does not come from faith is sin. And Anyone who knows the good he ought to do it, do and doesn't do it, sins. So there's sins that happen because you didn't do something good that you knew you should have done. Human sin is a broad spectrum disorder. There's many ways that we can be ungodly. So it's really a disaster for humans. And they've been however many years in existence, 6,000 years to my knowledge, and there's no solution come. As Paul wrote, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? I just want to give you another way that verse can be translated to share something with you. This verse can also be translated, who will rescue me from this dead body? And what might Paul be referring to? Here is a commentary that brings Paul's words to life. There seems to be here an allusion to the ancient custom of certain tyrants. Imagine this as a punishment. Who bound a dead body to a living man and obliged him to carry it about till the poison, the contagion from the putrid dead body took away the life of the living person carrying the dead body. So if that is what Paul is referring to, who will deliver me from this dead body? It's a very graphic description of that battle, that inner war of sin with godliness. And there's the reference for that. 
Um, it's from an, a 19th century Bible commentary. Um, I believe because it's got that Einid something of the references there at the end of the blue writing, it's probably on the internet somewhere these days. Um, and I remember reading about that habit in a um, novel once. It was, some, it was about a Siamese twins and one of them had died and back in the 14th or 15th century there was no way of separating them known and so the second person was dying it was quite graphic as well so the rescue package observe the present world all people suffer from the same internal battle between good and evil Paul wrote this about a person's conscience in Romans chapter 2. He says a conscience bears witness, accuses, or defends. That must mean that no one is immune from this spiritual personality conflict. It's not just people who know the Lord Jesus. Everybody has a conscience that bears witness, accuses, or defends. However, Paul's words, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord, signal that there's a rescue plan for humanity. Let's explore how that works. So first, we're going to read Romans chapter 8, verses 1 to 15 as though Paul had Paul didn't put a chapter break between where we stopped before so I'll continue reading therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because through Jesus Christ the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death for what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the spirit. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. The mind of sinful man is dead, but the mind controlled by the spirit is, wow, life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the spirit, if the spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we, we cry, Abba, Father. The, 
the two warring personalities are presented again in that, that portion of Romans chapter 8, but this time from the perspective of a different outcome. So I've put them in a table so that we can have a look at and compare. So have a look at this. So there's two tables here. There's life in the natural state. There's the verse that is talking about, and then there's life in the spirit. All right. So in verse one, it says in the natural state, humans are sentenced to death. In the spirit, they are not condemned any longer. In verse 2, it says they are bound. Well, the opposite of set free is they are bound because in the natural state, we are bound to death. In the spirit, we are made free of that condemned bit. In the natural state, people are controlled by self, verse 4. In the spirit, people can be controlled by Jesus' spirit. That needs cooperation, but it's a wonderful help to have that, to help overcome the controlled by self element. Verse five, the natural state thinks about what self wants. Very familiar. In the spirit, think about what Jesus wants. Verse 6 and verse 12, life in the natural state leads to death. Life in the spirit leads to life and peace. Verse 7, in the natural state, at war with God. Can't obey God or please him. In verse 7 and verse 8, don't belong to Jesus Christ in verse 9. In the spirit, in verse 9, belong to Jesus Christ. Verse 10, are made right with God. Verse 12, have a duty to put down self. Verse 13, must put to death sinful ways. The grounds of battle are certainly clearly laid out for the split personality. But the starting point in the spirit can have a totally different outcome because those are not things that the human can do on their own. They are all things God and Jesus do for the person. Verse 13, the person in the spirit will live forever. And we talked about eternal life last week, more to come in a future seminar, God willing. And in verse 15, in the natural state, people are slaves of death and afraid. In the spirit, they are children of God at peace. So the medication for this condition, detail of how God's promises work in the life of a believer are provided throughout the New Testament. First, Jesus Christ is the active mediator between God and people. Also, there's change of status with God. There's strength for the war. There's being forgiven. There's discipline there's suffering and there's direct intercession in the conscience 
by Jesus Christ. And there's boundless grace and love available for all people. That's quite a package of measures that God uses to heal spiritual split personality. Come and look at them one by one. Made righteous. Paul wrote that God gifts people righteous status. This is what Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 3. I consider everything a loss. He had lost everything that of his former life before he was a believer. And he, that's what he was talking about. His human status had been quite important in Judaism. But he lost all of that when he became a believer. I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. No more feeling inadequate, guilty, a failure, because God overlooks those features of human life in return for faith in him. Here's another. Therefore, since we have been justified, that is made right through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, Romans chapter 5. And yet another, it is God's will that you should be made holy. And there's more. We have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. Beautiful work that God does in us cleanses a guilty conscience. Another of God's medicines, he brings of bringing God to people. Jesus Christ actively works to bring God into people's lives. Paul writing to Timothy said, there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus. God wants to work in human lives. Paul wrote to the Philippians, it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. God actually wants to live in people. John wrote, if anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the son of God, God lives in him and he in God. What a status that is quite different to being an ordinary human. And Jesus wants to live in people. Jesus said in John chapter 14, if anyone loves me, my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. Another privilege is to be forgiven, something God chooses to do because of who he is. He has no rule book that demands he forgive. He just does because he loves people. And here's a quote from the letter, the first letter of John. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. 
if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So sometimes sinners feel, first of all, guilty and secondly, dirty or stained or marked or whatever word you like to use here, John is saying, God not only forgives, he takes away that taint, that residual feeling, that stain on our character or our personality. And for me, that is sometimes the hardest part to believe. It takes a lot of trust. The Apostle Paul wrote a letter to believers in Corinth in Greece, and he spoke of various bad behaviours. And he said that the people in that church had previously behaved like that too. However, now you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified, made right, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God, the active work of the Spirit of God justifies, makes holy, washes us clean. Being forgiven provides freedom and peace in the midst of the war. Paul calls this whole process reconciliation with God. Here in 2 Corinthians, he said, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. What a privilege being forgiven and reconciled really is. Another of God's treatments in the toolbox is discipline. Because discipline works for God. This is in Hebrews. Do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Because the Lord disciplines those he loves. If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. God disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. This is why this is in God's medicine jest, because it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace. When you have time, please read the whole of that section of Hebrews chapter 12 I've taken bits out of it. So do read the, the entire passage when you have time. Another weapon in God's medicine chest is suffering. Because again, suffering works for good. This quote from Romans, we rejoice in our sufferings. Yeah, right. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul wrote about 
sorry, there's a slide missing there, which we'll come back to that idea of suffering when the slide appears, it's out of order, obviously. Sorry about that. Intercession. The Apostle Paul wrote about intercession in the lives of believers. He said believers are on a journey, destination, transformation, into a copy of Jesus Christ. He said, my dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. This means that believers do not form Christ in themselves. That is a work that is being done in them if they cooperate. The Apostle Paul wrote that believers are being renewed. Look at this one. You must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. So note there that some of the work is to be done by the believers. Some is done from outside of the believer. People need to learn that being changed into God's likeness is not a cheap process. Patients need to be part of the treatment. The believer is responsible for their behaviours. And from that quote in Colossians on the previous slide, you must rid. Let's have a look. Rid yourselves. Do not. You have put on. The line above, you have taken off your old self. So the treatment of the split personality, the patient needs to be part of the treatment. It's not all just cheaply automatic for the patient. The patient has to do their bit. The other work is being done through active intercession by Jesus Christ on God's behalf. Here's a real life example from the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, living intercession by the Lord Jesus that shows us how this works. On the day before Jesus Christ was killed, he worked in love with his friend and follower, Peter. So I can't speak for you, of course, but for me, if I was going to go through the agony in the next 24 hours that the Lord Jesus did, I would not be bothering about other people. But you have a look at what Jesus was doing. One of the things Jesus was doing. Peter had been with Jesus for three years, witnessing his work, his character, his godliness. Jesus knew in advance that Peter would be overtaken by fear and deny that he knew Jesus. Look at how in his great love, Jesus interceded with Peter with warnings to prevent the failure, if it was possible, and with loving restoration post-denial. So the first warning, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I'm ready to go to you with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. Peter couldn't believe that. He didn't hear the warning. He only heard the potential challenge. 
the second warning. A few hours later, Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives and his disciples following, followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed. When he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping? He asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The third intercession happened while Peter was busy denying Jesus. And who knows where that would have progressed to without this intervention. This is the third time someone said to Peter, yeah, you're one of his followers. Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Fourth, with Peter, we find a message of reassurance later. A message from Jesus to a disciple. Go tell his disciples and Peter, he's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Notice the isolating of Peter. Tell Peter, make sure you tell Peter. It's a message of reassurance to Peter. Fifth, there's a special appearance to Peter. They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 and those with them assembled together. And those 11 were saying, it's true. The Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. That's Peter. So there was a special appearance to Peter, despite Peter's denials. And the last loving restoration that we know of is reported in John chapter 21, and I'll leave that for you to read at your own time, but it's a loving restoring of Peter to full reconciliation with his master, his Lord Jesus. So those six examples in one person's life give are a real life example of how Jesus intercedes to restore us, but also to prevent us from sinning. Sometimes it comes from another person. Sometimes it might be that you open the Bible and read something. Sometimes it's in our own heads. Sometimes it's all different ways that Jesus can use to try to prevent us sinning. Oh, here's, here's the last slide. Um, oh, I see what happened, sorry. Um, I, this is the last slide. Where we talked about suffering, um, we rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. God also did that with the Lord Jesus because look at this quote. This is in Hebrews chapter 5. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. You see, Jesus understands this process of transformation that the split personality believer goes through 
Jesus had the same split personality. He's crying to be saved from death. He does not wish to submit to the will of his father. But he was heard because his overall intention was to submit. But please, I'll submit, but not that one. But we know that he did, in the end, submit entirely. So he un understands entirely our problem of warfare and battle. So what's the patient's response to this? A number of responses are called for. Reliance on the physician. I'll just read you that verse, those two verses. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about the hardships we suffered in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, in our hearts, we felt the sentence of death. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. So first patient response that is on this slide is to rely on the physician, no matter how difficult the situation might be. Second response, acknowledge that the physician has all the power. We have this treasure in jars of clay, the body that fights the law of sin in the inside our body that fights with the law of God in our mind. He describes, this is Paul writing, describes that as we are a jar of clay so that we might understand that the all-surpassing power is from God, not from us. People cannot save themselves. No matter how perfect they may try to be, people cannot save themselves. The physician has all the power. Another response, have confidence when interacting with the physician. These verses here. We know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in God lives, sorry, whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment because in this world, we are like him. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. The patient has to continue with the medication. Do not drop out. Do not lose faith. Do not think it's all too hard. The Apostle Paul wrote this just before his death. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the marathon. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. There are the criteria for the crown. Do not drop out. Fight the good fight. Finish the race. Keep the faith. Long for his appearing. And Jesus Christ is with believers. Here is the last verse of the book of Matthew. I am with you always 
to the very end of the age. So what's happened to our in God's likeness, in God's image? At the beginning of this study, God's intention with people was discussed, to make people in his likeness. Reality shows that's not possible for people without God's assistance, that people are bound up in a battle, are split between self-serving and serving God. This study has considered the help that is given by God through his son to those who believe. Believers are on a developmental battle between self and spirit. They're being developed to live a life of love, as it says in Ephesians chapter five. Ultimately, when God's entire process with people is finished, in his likeness will be complete. So complete that God will dwell with men Look at this quote from the end of Revelation. Now the dwelling of God is with men and he will live with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. Wow, bring it on. So the split personality is now struck out. People will then be spiritually and morally in God's likeness. The war between God and human self-seeking will be over. The split personality will be entirely cured. God be praised. So victory. This is how Paul finishes this section in the book of Romans. Starting at verse 28, we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son. He is that in his likeness idea that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and those he predestined he also called those he called he justified those he justified he glorified what then shall we say in response to this if god is for us who can be against us he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, as it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. And we're considered a sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced, and I'm sure Paul is shouting as he's saying this, that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. That was very, <laughs> Jackie, 